we've talked through a lot of different practices. I think it's crucial to be a church that talks through the practices of the Bible so that you don't have belief without behavior. Amen? You can get motivated on a Sunday, but here's the question. What do you do on a Monday? And I think scripture has been clear, so I'm thankful that one, one, one month, every single year, we devote to helping you discover the type of life that is the result of following scripture. And so I'm excited to dive forward today. We're, today we're talking about another practice. Everybody say practice. So we've talked about <clears throat> the mindset, the biblical mindset for finances. We've talked about the tithe. I'm very excited for a lot of you. A lot of you, I, I sat this week in MMA. My, my son, he's six years old. If you hate MMA, don't send me an email. Okay. My six-year-old Baylor likes MMA. And I, I was sitting in his class and this uh, lady next to me said, oh, you're the you. And I was like, yeah, I, I'm the me. And she's like, no, you're the pastor. And she talked about her business and talked about how uh, her and her realtors and everybody's like, we heard about that tithe thing and we're all committed to tithe to the Lord and we're trusting the Lord. And I just think it's a beautiful thing to be a church that preaches the Bible and watches people receive it in an authentic, non-manipulative way. And people are just saying, I want to do it God's way. Amen. And a world that thinks money is all about using people to get more, get more. I'm excited to be a church that teaches the Bible so that we don't become what I call financial narcissists. Amen? Amen? Thankful for that. Today, we're going to talk about another practice. Write this word down, and we're going to explain it. I grew up in church, and I, I didn't know what it meant. It's offerings. Offerings, O-F-F-E-R-I-N-G-S. This is unique and different from the tithe, and this is, you're going to have to really pay attention to Scripture here because there is a unique difference. The tithe means, it's a mathematical term, it means tenth. And so you don't have to pray about it every time you get paid. You're like, oh, I, I, before I trust Tulu, before I trust the mortgage company, I trust the Lord. Amen? Amen. So you have the tithe, then you have offerings. Tithe are regular and repeating. It's just, it's constant. God is always first. Offerings are very different. In fact, a lot of your discipleship within your finances will come from offerings because nobody can tell you what to give. Right. Yeah. Let me give you three things that an offering is. Number one, it's a free will, meaning an offering is your choice. Like you have, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 says that each person should decide in their heart what to give, not out of compulsion, not out of manipulation. You don't need like emotional music and the story where the little fly lands on the nose. Like you don't need any of that. You need to decide in your heart. So number one, it's free will. I'm going to tell you something else about offering. Secondly, it's sacrificial. Sacrificial. Sacrificial is one of those things that hurts. Anybody ever been asked by God to do something like, ooh, yeah, if you study the Old Testament, which is where we first see sacrifice, like there's blood involved, something has to die. We all know this because we are recipients of the generosity of heaven, and the sacrifice was a death. So watch this. When you understand sacrifice, understand it's a death to something. So offerings are like a death. You offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. It's not a popular word, but it's a good word. How many of you guys agree? Some things in our life do need to die. Don't you think that an overabundance of materialistic thoughts should die? Don't you think that financial narcissism should be something we should put to death? Amen? Don't you think that selfishness is something we should put to death? So yeah, that's another thing. Here's the third thing you need to know about offering. It's spirit-led. It's not human-led. So you're going to have to get good at hearing and sensing the voice of the Lord. Some of you will call it like, I have this notion, I have this, this guttural instinct that uh, like my cousin went to Africa and she was raising money for a mission trip and I just had this thing like I'm supposed to pay for half of it and I looked at how much half was and I was like, ooh, that's a lot, God, are you sure? Remember, offerings are sacrificial. God, in order to build something, sometimes has to kill something. Does that make sense? In order to build salvation sacrifice of his son had to occur. So you see this from Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. Paul goes to churches like, hey, we got to start other churches. Whether you're poor or rich, the amount's not what's important. The sacrifice, all of you give your guts out because we got to start a church in Rome. And so this is one of the things that God uses. You know, your mind needs to be discipled, the disciplines of the Lord. Your relationships need to follow the Bible and be discipled. But also your finances need to be discipled. Amen. And so God has a system of offering. The question is why? Why would God come to you and well, when you're at the street corner, interrupt your busy schedule and say, give all the cash in your wallet to that person? You don't know that person. You don't know what they're going to do with it. Why? Because offering 
is a system that helps you win the war. Check this out. Win the war between two things. And here's what I want you to get this morning. The war between selfish living and surrendered living. Why in the world would God ask you to do something radical? Because God wants you to win the war between selfish living, where my money, my job, all about me, how I look, how I feel, how others see me, selfish living, and then you step into scripture, you're like, ooh, surrender. God's going to ask you to do that sometimes. I wrote this down in my notes. Satan's purpose for your life is selfish living. If Satan cannot get you addicted to drugs, maybe he can get you addicted to you. Because if he can get you addicted to you, you wor your world will become small. And if he ever gets you alone, then he can lead you better. The Bible says that the world of the generous gets larger and larger. And so a guy asked me the other day, he said, man, I feel like seven years in, like you're comfortable talking about what the Bible says about money now. And like, how, how did you get there? It was a pastor. Like, how, how, how did you get there? And I said, you know what I'm most afraid of? I'm, not, I'm no longer most afraid of somebody being offended at Scripture because, quite honestly, if J.D. gets offended at Scripture, J.D. probably needed to be offended. Like, if I hold money too tightly, then the Bible probably should offend me. Amen? But even most importantly... The reason why I unapologetically take a month every year to help disciple God's people is because I also live in a city where I see if you're talented and you work hard, you can get caught in this money trap. Wow. Have you seen this? Have you seen people obsess about opportunity and eventually it's idolatry? We call it a grind. We call it a hustle. But oftentimes it's idolatry. And our family's losing. Come on, somebody. Our marriage is losing. Our peace is losing. What good is it to gain the world if you lose your soul? Yeah. And so I, I just think in order to make sure that you don't become all about you and J.D. doesn't become all about J.D., God put together systems, including systems and finances. The tithe of like, before I go to me, before I go to Nordstrom, I'm going to the Lord. That's a good system for us. Amen? Amen. And then there's a system of offering where God could ask you something crazy. In fact, he may not ask. He may tell you. Why would God do that? Doesn't he have enough up there? Y'all heard the streets of heaven are paved with. Why would he do that? Because he's after your heart. Because Satan, Satan wants to kill and destroy you. And today I'm going to uncover his plan. God has a system for offering to put to death the thing that will kill you. What will kill you? 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Write this verse down. You need to notice the way the enemy shows up in your finances. Here we go. For everything in the world, watch this, the lust of the flesh. What a flesh. My body, what feels good, what tastes good, what I get addicted to, what gives me dopamine shocks, right? Lust of the flesh, lust of, lust of the eyes. What is lust of the eyes? What looks good. What is alluring to me? What is shiny? What is new? What is attractive? What gets more likes? What people compliment? Satan wants to get to you through lust of the flesh, what feels good, lust of the eyes, what looks good, and the pride of life. The pride of life is becoming the center of attention for others. So if Satan wants to sift you, if he wants to destroy you, he gets you to obsess about what looks good, what feels good. And thinking that you are the center of attention. And that's not good for you. That's why we preach this strongly. Because it's not good for you to get caught up in that money trap. Why? Because the world and its desires pass away. God is not calling you to build a dynasty to yourself, your own kingdom. God is calling you to build his kingdom. Amen? But whosoever does the will of God lives forever. So in order to combat and beat what Satan wants to do to your life, God implores systems, structure to make sure that you don't become all about you and that you're trustworthy and that your life becomes about others. And so he gives us an offering. And I just want to tell you from the outset, when God brings the people of God together and gives them a mission, that mission is your mission. So like think about us at a crossroads right now and we have this $2 million Goliath standing in front of us. Who does God use? God uses us. And here's the deal. Nobody from this pulpit will ever tell you what to give. That's manipulation. That is not of the Lord. But God will. God will. 
in order to get to your heart, God will give you something, a number that will scare you. You don't believe me? Let me take you to Matthew chapter 19. I want you to see this. The young man said, I've done all the things. I went to church. I went to, how many people remember Sunday school? Hello. I've done everything. What's left, Jesus? I'm trying to get this. I'm trying to go mature in my faith. What's left? If you want to give it all you've got, Jesus replied, go sell your possessions. Well, how much? Give everything to the poor. All your wealth will then be in heaven. To which he replied, what about down here? Okay. <laughs> then come follow me. So like before you can follow me, you have to surrender everything. Some of you are wanting traction and momentum with the Lord, and there's something standing in the way. It could be finances. It could be the one thing that you're like, no, that's mine. And Jesus, in this individual's life, asked him to sell everything and give it away. Now, do I think Jesus is going to ask you to give everything away? Probably not. Like, I don't feel like God's ever asked me to give it all away. But the question is, what would my answer be if he did? Because what we're trying to navigate towards is not selfish living, but surrendered living. Like the point of God's question, he probably wasn't even going to take it all. He was just going to see, where are you at on it? I heard Bishop Jakes one time say, do not tell me you're surrendered to the Lord if he can't have a yes to your stuff. So like the question is, is it really all the Lord's? Is, is my life about God and others or is my life about me? Because even with offerings, check this out. Offerings are like free will. I made the choice. It's sacrificial. Like it was an, oh, that hurt. Like it affected my bank account. Like it hurt. And it's spirit led. Did you know that you can even give an offering in such a way where God doesn't want it? That God is so specific about the way that you bring it to the Lord that there are people in scripture that brought like an offering and God's like, no, 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 bro, I don't want that. In fact, offerings go all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. Let me show you in Scripture because I don't want you to miss it. I want you to experience the radical nature, the adventure of living with a God and being obedient to a God that when he asks you, you say yes, and you experience a life of overflow. Everybody say overflow. This surrender living is a life and what it looks like for God to be in total control. The Bible says that God gives seed to the sower. He gives seed to the sower. But you have to sow his way. You don't come up with your own number. You listen to the Lord. Look what happened in Genesis chapter 4. Time passed. Cain brought an offering to God from the produce of his farm. I imagine it was a big vegetable charcuterie board. How many of you guys know if there's some broccoli, I need some ranch? Hello. Abel also brought an offering. Two brothers. One brings a big, beautiful vegetable offering. Abel also brought an offering, but from the firstborn, it was special, it was unique, it was sacrificial. It wasn't just I plucked some stuff here, it was the firstborn animals of his herd. Choice cuts, not any, co- not any cut. He didn't go to Kroger, he went down there to, uh, where's a good one? Costco. <laughs> Meat market. Right? Publix. <laughs> Better than Walmart. Now watch this. God liked Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering didn't get his approval. Just because you present something to the Lord doesn't mean he accepts it. Wow. Why? Because God is trying to get us from selfish living our way, our way, our amount, our number, our timing, to God's way. Our first and our best and our sacrificial way. That's what God's trying to get us all to. I was thinking the other day, my goodness, could you imagine what would happen in our world if every believer, everyone who says, I have so freely been given grace and mercy and salvation that everything I have is the Lord. So you have to be careful because God will ask you for the thing that's trying to take his spot. Be careful how much you like that new truck, bro. God may ask you to give it. It's the truth. I'll never forget I saved up money and bought an acoustic guitar um, I, back, 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 back in the day. I was a massive fan of John Mayer. I thought John Mayer was like going to be a worship leader at my church. And just, I saw us doing ministry together and it's going to be phenomenal. And we were going to be buddies and write songs together. And, you know, I could see it. And so I went out and bought a guitar that was just like his. And I thought it was like the best guitar in the world. 
I played that thing so hard, I used to get like blood all on the inside because I was trying to pick like him. And I got, you know, I got sausage fingers. I can't, I can't really do it like John Mayer. But it, I love that guitar. It's just, it's a thing, but I loved it. I saved up for it. Have you ever had a thing? I remember sitting in the back room and there were missionaries from Israel that were coming through. And I, was, I, was, I just finished setting the guitar up and we were going to help the missionaries get on stage and, and bless them to go change the world. And I, I have this thing in my gut that says, give that young boy your guitar. To which I replied, no. <laughs> Anybody else ever done that? Like th this group of missionaries was going to try to start a church in Israel to minister to the Palestinians and Arabs. Today, they have one of the largest Palestinian Christian churches in the world. It's like 47 people to 10. That's unbelievable. But it was, man, that meant something to me. That was like my, mm. and I didn't want to do it. But I felt led, and it was sacrificial. But can I tell you something? The moment I decided to give that away, it unlocked something in me that was an adventure. To know that I had a small part in helping the worship team in Israel minister the gospel. And I'll tell you what I held so tightly to. The moment I gave away, it's like God began to change my heart. And I'll tell you the same thing. When God speaks to you, and I'm going to show you how in a minute. If you will just decide that whatever's in his hand is a thousand times better than what's in your hand, I think we get a little bit more humble. I think we become more generous. And I'll tell you, there is no feeling and there is no life like the type of life that gets God's attention. I want you to live a life where God goes, whoa, they trust me? More. Oh, they trust me? More. Oh, they're going to make a difference with it? More. Oh, they're not going to let that promotion get to their head? More. That's the way God, because God wants to bless people around you. So the question is, if some offerings are accepted and some aren't, like how do you prepare your heart so that you're ready when God speaks to you? How many of you guys know if you haven't prepared and God comes to you, it's too late to prepare? Like if your heart isn't ready and God says a number to you concerning the offering, you may be like, <laughs> no. And so I just want to help you as a pastor prepare because we'll never tell you around here what to give. But we unapologetically say, go talk to the Lord. Go talk to the Lord and see what he has. So let me give you three things that have helped Lee and I navigate these radical, sacrificial crossroads in life where our church is standing in front of this impossibility. We have this Goliath where the bank says, hey, if you're going to find land, you need to go get two million. Watch this now. And by the way, that's the minimum. It could go up, but let's, let's conquer the first bear. Number one, how do you prepare your heart for this? Number one, give God your yes, watch this, in advance. You know what we have to do? We have to pre-decide that whatever God whispers, our answer is yes to that. That when God whispers, when God says something to us, we trust him so much that if he says it, our response is yes. You know what I want to be to the Lord, honestly? A yes, man. He's trustworthy. We can do that with him. You know what you need to be for the Lord? A yes, woman. A yes, man. That God can trust you that in a moment's notice, without having to read a book, if God says, share your story with the person in that cubicle, you don't wait, you don't hesitate. Yes, yes, Lord. Um, hey, I feel like I'm supposed to come like share my story and I don't even know where to start. I wasn't prepared, but God, like, God changed my life and I went to this freedom group and like I got rid of some stuff and the reason you've noticed me being more peaceful lately is God did it all. And I don't know why I was supposed to share that with you and then they break down, they start crying and it was a God moment. Why? You just pre-decided. When God whispers, when God gives you this notion, can you just be a yes man? Can you be a yes woman? Amen? So number one, pre-decide that when God says it, yes. So I'm going to listen to the Lord, but when he says the number, I'm going to say yes. Number two, you need clarity. So ask God for your portion. You are not responsible to do it all. Some of you need to hear this because some of you are leaders and you like control and you want to be in the driver's seat. No, 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 no. God uses a church family. Do not take all of the responsibility on yourself because then you'll do nothing. You'll think, well, I can't do it all, I'll do nothing. No, no. Your portion, your responsibility. Your resp all of us are the church. All of us carry responsibility. And it's not about equal amount. Amen? It's about equal sacrifice and saying yes to the Lord. 
So ask God for your portion. Let me make it more clear. Ask God, you have five weeks. Five weeks. We're not doing it now. Go talk to the Lord. Go talk to the Lord. Don't go to your calculator. That's not faith. That's saying, what can we afford? That's not faith. Ask the Lord, God, if we had all the faith in the world because of how thankful we are, what is our portion of this goal? And you let the Lord speak to you. Amen? Number three, and this is, this is huge for you, sow with expectancy. You have to be a farmer with your faith. When farmers sow, they expect something. Now watch this. The motivation for giving is never getting. Did you hear me? We don't give to get around here. Watch this. We give to give. But at the same time, we know that our God is a rewarder of those who are sowing. So we believe in reaping. So when you sow, you don't stare at the ground and go, man, I hope something comes up. You, you know it. You know God is faithful. Amen? All of this can happen. And you can have a surrendered heart. You can have the type soil where God says, I trust you. You can have a yes in your spirit if you understand Romans chapter 12. Apostle Paul, this guy who spoke five languages and, and wrote most of the New Testament, he's going to start a church in Rome. And I don't know if you've studied Rome or the Gentile church, but that's like starting a church in a strip club. Like they were wild. Like if you go read the book of Corinthians, like they're having like orgies at church. Did you hear me? Okay, how awful is that? And so Apostle Paul is sent by the Lord to go minister to those people, to talk to those people. Well, they have given their life to Jesus, and so they're like worshiping the Lord. They're exemplifying the gifts of the Lord, but then they're having orgies right after. And so Paul comes to them because Paul is trying to get them. He's thankful that they have a relationship with the Lord, but watch this. He's trying to help them carry the responsibility of the mission. So a relationship is easy, and God wants it that way. But then you have to mature into responsibility. That I do, I'm not just a receiver. I'm going to be a giver. Amen? Amen? So here's Romans chapter 12. I think if we embody this, we become a church God can use. And no Goliath will be too big for us because we'll have faith and will be obedient to what the word of the Lord says. Romans chapter 12, it says, Therefore I urge you, Paul is on his knees here. The great Paul studied under Gamaliel, here coming down to minister to the Gentiles. I urge you, I beg you. Look what he calls them, brothers and sisters. These wild banshees. <laughs> He's calling brothers and sisters. He's acknowledging that, hey, if you believe in Jesus, we are the church. I know you're looking at Paul because he's up there and he has the pen in his hand and he's the great Paul, but no, no, we are family. We're brothers and sisters. Watch this. In view of God's mercy, underline that. Underline that. Highlight that. In view of God's mercy. Sowing will never make sense unless you view sowing through the lens of God's mercy. Have you thought about your life? in the viewpoint of God's mercy. What should have happened when you sinned like that? The marriage you should have lost because of the way you let it, sir? What should have happened on that highway that did, you should have been in a wreck and you didn't get a wreck? You should have got a DUI? You should have lost your job? How many people have ever had a mess up? I'm going to ask again. Hey, he ain't lying up in church. God got lightning up there. He'll, he'll do something to you. Amen. How many of you have ever messed up? And if you ain't raising your hand, that's pride. That's your mess up. Hello. Can we just be honest? Here together in the house of God with a ton of vision in front of us to cross over and do something historic, none of us should be here. God using us? That's hilarious to me. It is to me because I know me. Amen? Anybody else keenly aware of just how human you are? The fact that God is using us? 6,000 people have given their life to Christ using us? That's hilarious to me. Why? He's merciful. He's merciful. Every day I don't wake up to the reality that I've earned. Every day I wake up to the reality he has so graciously and mercilessly gave to me. Yeah. Yeah. Sowing never makes sense unless you view it through his mercy. Yeah. 
Now, what does he tell us? Because of this mercy to bring an offering, this is a priestly duty. We're not just family. We are migrating from family to priest. The Bible says that you are a priest. You and your household, you and your condo, you and your apartment, that you're a leader. You're to bring something to the Lord. David said, I'm never going to the house of God and not bringing something that costs me. Sacrifice. Offer your body a living sacrifice. You ever thought about what a living sacrifice is? Imagine a lamb tied up, squirming on the altar, totally surrendered just before the blood falls on the altar. That's a living sacrifice. That's what he wants you to be, a totally surrendered Paul calls us a bond servant to the Lord. That God, everything is yours. A living sacrifice. Watch this. Holy and pleasing. You want to please the Lord? Surrender to the Lord. This is your true and proper worship. And I'll just tell you, we're ending. Nothing gets God's attention like a yes. So how do we do this? As a church, how do we traverse this historic opportunity when people like JD and people like you surrender to the Lord listen to the Lord and simply obey the Lord and I believe I believe this Goliath that stands in front of us is going to be one more dead giant in the vision and life of this church so what I wanted to do is I wanted to stop speaking and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. I wanted to create a moment where five weeks out, the Holy Spirit can let us surrender. And then for some of you, he's gonna whisper to you. Some of you, you're a college student. Watch this, college student. And God's gonna add up all the Raymond Noodle bills from now to December 4th. You don't think he'll do it. He could ask you for it. It's true. If you think that giving and offerings are just for older people, you miss out on the principle of scripture. You don't want to wait till you're 50 to be blessed. You don't want to wait till 50 to be obedient to the Lord. If you're a teenager and God whispers to give your allowance over the next 30 days or five weeks to the Lord, you say yes to the Lord. Can I get an amen, parents? You trust the Lord. And so I'm going to ask everybody to stand to their feet. God's going to ask you for something over the next five weeks. You just listen to the Lord. And two million is the goal, but like, I don't know what he's going to tell you. College student, it could be $12.47. How many people remember Raymond and ramen noodles? Hello. Do you say Raymond or ramen? (laughs) That was a little judgy. I'm going to say Raymond again to get on your nerves. You're like, I called Asia. No, you didn't. Ramen. Okay, ramen. You could be... You could be newly married and, and you have a portion saved up. And God may, I, I don't know. God, I'm just telling you, like, he may. Because God will ask for the thing that's trying to take his spot. Some of you may have had a windfall and, like, you can't even explain why God has brought millions into your business. Until you read scripture and realize the increase is meant for impact. What is the more? Well, I have more than I need. What's the more for? Others? And so God may unapologetically ask you to be the first person ever to give a million dollars to the vision. God may ask you to give nine dollars. I don't know what he's going to ask. I just want you to be the type person that can say yes to him. Don't hold so tightly to what the world says. We could take the spirit of Elsa here and... (laughs) There it is. Somebody on the second row went, let it go! I think that was pretty good, wasn't it? Thank you. You're extra kind. Would you like to be on staff someday? You can be on staff. When the bank said $2 million, I went, yeah, we're good. And then all week I began praying and saying, God, don't make, don't, please do not let me and my ways make you look small in this moment. God, do not let us as a church make you look small in this moment. 
Sowing will never make sense unless we're surrendered. So in this moment, in this moment, Father, we as a church body say whatever you can do through a church, would you do it through us? Our answer to you is yes. In fact, as a sign of surrender, can we all lift our hands to the Lord? We're going to sing a song that we wrote that helps us surrender to the Lord. Come on, lift your hands. Even if you're not comfortable, I know it's the first time, maybe do it, maybe carry the TV. You don't have to do the touchdown, carry the TV. Or you can just be, what's up, hug. That's okay. Okay. But it's a sign of surrender. Come on, lift your hands to the Lord. Father, I pray that we would surrender in this moment. Two million dollars is nothing to you. Give us our portion. I pray that you would even speak to the minds of the believers. Five weeks out, Father, give us our number so we can say yes to you, Lord. This is a house of miracles because this is a house of surrender. As your hands are lifted, let's worship the Lord. Let's lean in together.